if you could download a PhD in any subfield of computer science into your brain today, what subject would that be in? I think the one ha that I haven't learned at all and one which is really useful and one that I got fooled by today is machine learning. So I think I would probably choose that. Everybody, I have with me here today, William Lin. William is an international grandmaster on code forces. He's been doing this for only a few years. He's only 18 years old. He recently got accepted to MIT. He's won several competitive programming competitions. He's got an awesome YouTube channel that you guys should definitely check out and subscribe to if you haven't yet. And he is one of the up and coming competitive programmers in this field. It's such an honor to have his codeliness here with us today. William, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. College just started and it's taking a bit of my time, but yeah, sure. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. I know it's like 9 a.m. in Taiwan right now where you're at, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, pretty early. Yeah, college classes have been like messing up my schedule since I'm in Taiwan. Yeah. I can only imagine. And so I'm going to ask you these five questions in a row and you have three lifelines. You have 50, 50, which means that I'll eliminate two for you. You have phone a friend, which means you will literally phone a friend with your phone on, on speaker phone while we're talking for one minute and they'll have, they'll answer for you or ask the audience. In this case, we don't have an audience. So I will be your audience and you will ask me and I will give you a hint. Does that sound good, William? Can you be my friend? I can be your friend. I can be your friend. <laughs> okay. Sure. I'll be your friend too. Um, so are you ready to play? Yes. The question is given a string S consisting of only ones and zeros, find a number of substrings which start and end both in one. I'll give you some time to read this question. Okay, so looking at the first example, one, 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 it has four ones and its output is 10. So just like the formula should be like something like um, the number of ones choose two. So that leaves A and C. And then I'm not even sure C is correct because like, can you, I'm not familiar with Python, but can you like, I don't know if this syntax, like where you do 4x in s, I thought it was supposed to be like 4x in range s. But anyways, like you only output one, like one answer per test case. So like there's no loop for the print statement. So I would say it's A. Okay, is A your final answer? Yes, it is. All right, let's check that out. You're right, congratulations. You got the first question correctly. Good work, William. We're moving on to question two. All right, we can move to the second one. The second question is, which technique often does not require data feature engineering? Is it A, classification via support vector machine, B, deep learning, C, regression via decision tree, or D, XGBoost? I don't know any machine learning. This is oh. going to be. Well, this is, we're going to modify competitive programming a little bit throw some machine learning in there. You remember, you do have three lifelines, so you can use those at any point. That, that's a very big modification. Hmm. But what, was the, what was the thing you said in the question? Which technique often does not require data feature engineering? Does not require it. Sounds like, I don't know if that's a specific term or something, but it sounds like data feature engineering just sound, sounds like pre-processing data, but I could be wrong. I like the way you're thinking right now. Mm -hmm. 
You do have three lifelines. I just want to. Okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll ask my friend or the audience. Okay, um, which, which one? Wait, does it matter? It does matter, just for the sake of this. Even All right, though... sure. I'll, I'll ask my friend, which is you. Okay, let me um, go get your friend. Hold on. I guess the best I can say for you is that feature engineering is such a crucial part of all machine learning, and it has been for 30 plus years. So almost every machine learning model uses some form of feature engineering. It's only in the past five to 10 years that we've seen a new type of machine learning that doesn't require anywhere near as much feature engineering. As Professor Andrew Eng at Stanford said, this technique is like something where you just give it rocket fuel and the rocket engine and it will just outperform everything else like you've never seen in your life it's better than everything all right i hope that helps i gotta go do other things see ya actually i'm not sure of any of the answers you have two more lifelines you can absolutely use them okay I go with the 50 50. absolutely all right, we're gonna take away two of the answers and only two will remain. Here we go. The two remaining answers are B, deep learning, and C, regression via decision tree. If it's pretty new, then it's I've never heard of C, so I guess it would be the new one. So I guess I'll go with C. Is that your final answer? Yes, that is my final answer. Well, <laughs> you lost. I'm sorry. Oh, oh that's man. A... Oh. Oh, so what exactly is deep learning? Deep learning came around in 2012 when we took neural networks, which were one specific type of machine learning model. There's like 50 to 100 of them. We just took one specific version of them. We fed it more data than we've ever fed anything else, like over a terabyte of cat images at first and more computing power at the time. It was like something like, I think eight GPUs stacked on each other. And it had an image classification accuracy that blew every other technique out of the water. And from then on, we knew that instead of engineering and selecting specific features for image classification or say regression or really almost any task, we could just give this type of model, this neural network, a lot of data and a lot of computing power and it would just figure out what the relevant features are for whatever the objective is by itself. And that phenomenon collectively of all those different variations of neural network methodologies, we call deep learning. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yes. I do want to keep going, even though uh, we lost. Can we do one more question? Yeah, of course. We can like just keep going through the questions. I don't mind. Okay. All right. Let's go to the third one. This one is a restaurant where you have N to one jobs available. I'll let you read this. Oh, this is a standard, pretty standard problem. I think it's like, you can see this on multiple online judges, basically you sort the numbers and then the minimum difference will be, the minimum difference will be like one of the differences between the adjacent numbers. So. Uh, B doesn't sort the numbers. Then C doesn't, C and D don't take the difference. So the answer should be A. Is that your final answer? Yes. Correct. You got it. In this post game game that we're playing right now, where the points don't matter, it's more for the fun of it. Yeah. Nice work. Let's go to the next one. For our second machine learning question <laughs> What type of machine learning system does the following equation represent? By actually reading out this equation, I would give the answer, I think. 
Actually, I wouldn't. So let me just read it. It's a minimax game where you have two functions, G and D. And V is the outermost function that is a function of D and G. And the four possible techniques are A, this is a variational autoencoder, B, Newton's method, C, this is a generative adversarial network, or D, this is gradient descent. I think if it's gradient descent, then I should, I actually like seen it before. Maybe like there should be a gradient somewhere then. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like it's calculating something like a gradient. So I don't think it's D. Okay, good. Minimax appears in like, um, appears in like game theory where, where like you're trying to trying to maximize your outcome while the opponent is trying to minimize your outcome. But I don't know if that's related to this at all. Yep, that's exactly what this is. Is the Newton's method even a machine learning thing? It is a machine learning thing. It is a calculus. Wait. It's a calculus technique. Uh, I see. As is gradient descent, which are both subsets of machine learning. Oh, okay. I was, yeah, so I, I was like wondering like how Newton was able to like come up with his own machine learning method. Then I recalled that like, I think I've heard of something in calculus. So it's A or C. Getting somewhere. I see the ad adversarial in uh, choice C makes me seem like it seems like something which is like familiar in game theory. So it does. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the audience. All right, let's pull the audience. Vote now. What does a variational autoencoder do? All right, the audience has a resounding 100% of the vote is for C, generative adversarial networks. And the audience says, because variational autoencoders are stochastic models, they're random models. Um, so are generative adversarial networks. Actually, both A and C are generative models. You give them some input data, they will apply a random variable to that data. And by apply, I mean, it will compute a dot product operation with that input matrix. And the result will be a randomized version of the input that we can think of as new types of data, maybe new types of images, new types of video, new types of strings. GPT-3 would be an example of a generative model because you're generating data. So they're both generative models. The difference is that the generative adversarial network plays a minimax game in its approach to generating new types of data, where you have a discriminator and a generator, the generator is gen generating new types of data, the discriminator is classifying each of the outputs of the generator as binary values, real or fake, and then both are optimized using gradient descent. Whereas in a variational autoencoder, you have one network, but we could think of it as Actually, there are two networks. We have one network that encodes the data into an intermediary representation, state space. And then we have another network that then generates data using that state space. The random variable exists inside of the hidden layer, which is applied such that whenever the new data is generated with the second network, it's slightly varied. So every time you have some varied output. Yes, uh, C then. Nice work. Yes, congrats. Yeah, it did. Oh, yeah, the, um, the, it was like the 
discriminator and the generator, that's DNG. Yes. Yeah, this, it's actually interesting. I didn't think so. You have like neural network which checks another neural network, or is it neural network? Yes. Oh yeah, it's network. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think I would see something. I, I didn't see how I see mini max here. Yeah, got to keep it different. All right, let's move on to the last question, the hardest one. You see, um, set. Yeah, so first you want to find the set of the jobs which have not been done before. And mm -hmm. I don't exactly know what, I didn't know what that is Python, but after seeing the choices A and B, I think it's like set something minus set something, I think. That's the notation. Yep. Yeah, so it's either a or B. And then B only prints. Oh, B only prints one line, apparently. Where it's cut off. But Not cut off, it's all there. Oh, okay. But anyways, yeah, you would start from, I'm pretty sure you would start from, start outputting from the zero index and not the one index. So that's what A does. So I think it's A. Okay. Final answer? Yes. Nice work. So, wow, that was, that was really good. You got most of them correct. Mm -hmm. And now we have one bonus question. Do you want to do the bonus question? Sure. All right. That is an after actual problem. So after you put in so yeah, after you put in the, like, select one marble for each K of them, because you need at least like one per, car, per color, you have minus K left. And then you want to, you want to distribute that between K colors. And then that's a combinatorical problem. So forgot the name, maybe like, maybe you call it like stones and sticks or like balls and boxes. But the general idea is <laughs> if you consider the number of ways to order n minus k objects and then k minus one separators, uh, if, you, if you choose some ordering of these, then the separators will separate those n minus k objects into k groups. So, and then like each group will be its own color. So number of ways, and then the number of ways to do that arrangement is that's n minus k plus k minus one, choose k minus one, which is just minus one, choose k minus one. So now we need to calculate that quantity. And this is interesting because uh, normally this could, this like number could be very big. But so normally they would ask you to use, normally they would tell you to like find a number modulo some number like 10 to the 9 plus 7. But then mm -hmm. apparently in this case, it says like the answer will, will always fit into a signed 64 bit integer. So either I got, either I got the problem wrong or like 
the input is constrained so that the answer will never be too big. But um, I'll just assume that it's the latter. So I'll just write some code right now. I get a chance to like compile and test this or? Yes, yes you do. We'd okay. love to see it. So now for, let's start reading the number of test cases. And then K and then answer is N choose K of N minus one and K minus one. And now I just need to implement this function. So the way, so see there was a, it was the method. I remember you can like keep the product and then let me think of like how to write this out. So there's ten times minus one times all the way to k. No, we're actually. two minus k plus one and then divided by one divided by two the same formula I described earlier multiply we'll r by n minus i plus one and we divide it by i. And in the end, you should give the correct results. Now let me test the given test cases. It seems to have worked for the given sample test. I see it. I see the correct output. Yeah. Amazing work. Awesome. Well, William, it has been a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, I will send you a free book anyway, just for being here. Oh, and cool. Uh, I wish you the best of luck as you continue this journey of yours as a competitive programmer. Any final closing thoughts? Uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for having me here. It was fun and like, especially to like, see machine learning like names that I've never seen before. And yeah, I hope you have like a great day.